This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Uh, okay, I'm going to have Shabbos Rabbi Shalom Aleichem. Great to see everybody. I want to share with you some thoughts on Parshas Kisisa by uh, the command to make the Shemen Hamishcha. The Pasuk says, Vi'ata kach lecha. And now take for you. Why does it say for you? This is not for Moshe Rabbeinu. This is to anoint the Kalim of the Mishkan, to anoint Kaihanim. But in what way is it for you? Why is it called Vi'ata kach lecha? Why lecha? Moshe is not a Kayin. <clears throat> Another interesting question you could ask is Rashi keeps on reiterating that all the anointings are like a cuff, except for that of the Malachim, which uh, are like a crown. So Rashi says the Shemana Mishcha is used for the Koyhanim. They're all with the, as the letter Kaf, except for the anointing of the kings. Why is Rashi telling me about kings are anointed with the Shemana Mishcha? Why is it relevant here in this parsha? I mean, were there any kings being anointed with this Shemana Mishcha? Is Rashi just telling us for informational purposes that the use of the Sheva Namishcha is for Malachim? Rashi, Rashi reiterates this later on when he says, Kal Meshichas Mishkan Vikaihanim U Malachim. Also, he says on the Pasuk that if any Zar anoints uh, with the Sheva Namishcha, that if it's not a Kayin and not a Melech, so why does Rashi keep on reiterating that the Sheva Namishcha is for kings? We perhaps could say that in fact this Shemana Mishcha was used for kings because Moshe Rabbeinu was a Melech, like the Ramban explains on the Pasuk, Vayhi Bishurun Melech. And it needs Shemana Hamishcha. He needed Shemana Hamishcha for himself. Therefore, Rashi reiterates many, many times that this was not just used for Kaihanim, it was used for kings, namely for Moshe Rabbeinu himself. And perhaps that's the reason why it says, Va'ata kach lecha. And you take for yourself. Why for yourself? To indicate that Moshe Rabbeinu also perhaps needed to be anointed with the Shem and Hamishcha. Rashi says on the Pasuk, Lama Hashem yechere apecha. Hashem, why are you getting angry? Rashi says, A wise person is only jealous of another wise person. A mighty person is only jealous of another mighty person. Why is Moshe Rabbeinu uh, emphasizing Hashem, why are you getting jealous here? Why is Moshe Rabbeinu referring to God's wrath here as jealousy? And I think simply the explanation is in Va'aschanan we say Hashem is Kel Kana which we say means He is jealous to take revenge. So we see that when it comes to Avodah Zara, there's a concept of the kinah of Hashem. God is zealous. That is why Moshe Rabbeinu refers to Hashem's wrath in this context as jealousy. Okay, here's another interesting idea. The Moshe Rabbeinu pleads with Hashem. He says, God, they're going to say that they took us out that you took us out to kill us in the mountains. Mountains? What mountains are there in the Midbar? So I once saw in the Sefer Allah Benayim Hashem in the name of the Sefer Ma'asei Choyshev that the Gemara in Shabbos says Hashem suspended the mountain over our heads like a barrel. So, and that if we don't keep the Torah, Hashem will drop the mountain on our head. So Moshe Rabbeinu is saying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem, if you wipe us out, then Mitzrayim is going to say that you took us out to kill us in the mountains. What mountain? Har Sinai. Because if we don't keep the Torah, then we'll have the mountain dropped on our head. And if you'll ask, so why does the Pasuk say mountains, plural? So we could say, based on what we said over many times in the Balaturim on the Pasuk, that Yisyatsu betachtis hahar, the Har Sinai Oshan Kulai. That it says, they stood on the bottom of the mountain, 
and Har Sinai was all smoked up. This teaches that it was like a mountain on top of a mountain. Um, <clears throat> so the Balaturim is bothered. Why does it first say the pronoun and then the noun? Why does it first say Hahar the mountain and then Vahar Sinai Ashan Kulai? It should say under Har Sinai and the mountain was Ashan Kulai. So the Balaturim says, from here we see there were two different mountains. Yalkut Ruveni, we find that Har Hamoiria was uprooted from its place so that the Torah should be given on such a holy spot, namely Har Hamoria. So there were two mountains present at Kabbalah Satoira. There was Har Sinai and there was Har Hamoria as well. So perhaps this would explain why. Moshe Rabbeinu said, Mitzrayim in the mountains, referring to Har HaMariya and Har Sinai. Perek Lamed Beis Pasuk Chafhei Parua, Farua Rashi says, Farua means Megula, uncovered. Their shame was uncovered. Like in the Pasuk, Upara es roish ha'isha. You will uncover the head of the woman. Rashi is bringing a proof. What does the word parua mean? Parua means uncovered. Like the Pasuk says, we do to a saita, we uncover her hair. I would humbly suggest Rashi is citing the Pasuk, Upara es roish ha'isha, not just to indicate what the word parua means, but also to explain the procedure that happened to B'nai Yisrael. In other words, the Bnei Yisrael, by sinning with the Egel, were likened to a Saita. They were marrying God at Sinai. And they, by worshipping the Egel, they were unfaithful to Him. And therefore, they are treated like a Saita. And just like in a Saita, we uncover her here, where Ufara es roi shaisha, so too... So too, the Jewish people were uncovered, their shame was uncovered. Like we say earlier, like Rashi himself said earlier, Vayashkas B'nai Yisrael. He gave B'nai Yisrael to drink. Rashi says, why did Moshe give them to drink? He intended to check them like a saita. So they in reality had the halachic status of a saita. Therefore it says, Farua to indicate that they were, they were indeed treated like a soita. Rashi says on the words, Pesalacha, carve out for yourself, that Hashem showed Moshe a mountain of precious stone, and He said, the, re the refuse will be yours. And from there Moshe Rabbeinu became very wealthy. So it's interesting, Moshe Rabbeinu became very wealthy from carving out the Luchais Shniais. It's interesting that he became wealthy from carving out the Luchai Shniyais. You would have thought, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu took a stand, and maybe he suffered in his standing, he suffered in his status. No, we know from the Beis Halevi that the Luchai Shniyais elevated Moshe Rabbeinu tremendously. That by Luchai Shniyais, the Luchais were shining. By the Luchai Shniyais, Moshe's face was shining. The reason being, the Luchai Shniyais the oral law was inscribed on the tablets themselves. By the Luchai Shniyais, only the written law was on the tablets. The oral law was now inscribed on the heart of Moshe. So Moshe Rabbeinu became, so to speak, like the parchment of the oral law. So not only did Moshe Rabbeinu gain spiritually by breaking the Luchais, here we're learning he gained financially. And from here we learn, uh, this is an illustrative of a very important principle. That when a person does and stands up for the right thing, they don't lose out. They don't, be, they don't lose their spiritual level, they don't lose their physical assets. It's always, it, in the end, it's in their best interest. Okay, two more ideas. You know, it's interesting, Rashi points out in Perek Lamedalet, Pasuk Aleph, I'm going to give you the land of the Kanani, the Chiti, the Amoiri, Rashi says six nations are mentioned here, but the Girgashi, they left before we even got there. 
But what's interesting is Rashi already said that earlier in Perak Lamed Gimel, Pasuk Beis. Rashi said the exact same thing. Hashem said, I'm going to take you into Eretz Yisrael. You're going to inherit the land of the six nations. And the seventh nation will run away. Rashi already told that to us. So you could explain very simply that the first time he said it is when Hashem said, I'm not going to be with you. I'm sending an angel to take you into Eretz Yisrael. So you would think then, six of the nations would, uh, only one nation will run away, and the other six you'll have to chase out. But now that Hashem has ceded to the tefillah of Moshe Rabbeinu, you could, perhaps you would have thought, that maybe now all the nations will run away. So maybe that's why it needs to be reiterated, that even though now I'm going to lead you in myself, still, only uh, one nation will run away, we'll still have to chase out the other six. And final thought. After the mitzvah of Shalosh Pa'amim Bashana, Yira'eh Kol Zechorcha, the mitzvah Ali Ala Regal, the Pasuk says, V'herchavti es kvulecha, I will widen your boundaries. Rashi says, Now that you're very far from the Beis HaMikdash, and you can't come and see my face always, Therefore, I give you the mitzvah of Aliyah Laregel. Why is there a mitzvah of Aliyah Laregel? Because you're not able to come see my face always. Which means that ideally, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, He wants us to come see Him every day. It's just not practical. In other words, it's not that, look, look, you have to come see me three times a year. It's the reason why I'm saying you should come see me three times a year is because, look, it's not, I've widened your borders, so you can't come always, so at least come now. But the hargasha, the feeling is that, it's really that Hashem is, He wants us always. He would, it's just not practical, it's not feasible. But it's a result of the fact that we can't be there every day. Okay, those are just some thoughts on the parsha. I want to share with you some, uh, some questions. Okay. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.